First Kings chapter six and seven. There's a lot of material here, <coughs> but uh, we'll make some ground tonight. The building of Solomon's temple. That's what we're dealing with in this section. Uh, this is a, a historical event for the nation of Israel. Uh, it's going to be one of the great achievements, one of the landmark sorts of events in their history. Uh, and the temple as a place of worship, a, um, a place for God's people to come together for collective worship. Um, whether it was Solomon's temple uh, that we read about here, or uh, Herod's temple, which would be the one that exi uh, you know, existed at the time of Christ, um, the temple is long been a prominent fixture in Jewish culture and in their society. And when Jesus came, uh, things changed just a bit. The temple proper uh, no longer became really the place for worship to um, happen. Uh, we no longer need, um, as God's people, a building per se to worship the Lord. Jesus said in John chapter 4, Believe me, the hour is coming and is now here, when the true worshipers will worship the Father, not in Jerusalem, but in spirit and truth. For the Father is seeking such people to worship Him. And so the temple here, uh, though it's a, a big deal for Israel at the time of its construction, uh, was at one time the place of worship. It is no longer. Uh, worship is not to emanate from a building as much as it is from God's people collectively. 1 Corinthians chapter 3, verse 16 says, Don't you know that you yourselves are God's temple and that God's Spirit dwells in your midst? In 1 Corinthians chapter 6, it says, Don't you realize that your body is the temple of the Holy Spirit who lives in you and was given to you by God? There are other New Testament scriptures to kind of underscore this idea. In Ephesians chapter 2, verse 22, it says, You are being made part of this dwelling where God lives by His Spirit. And in 1 Timothy chapter 3, verse 15, it says, God's household is the church of the living God, the pillar and foundation of the truth. And you get to Hebrews chapter 3, verse 6, it says, Christ as the Son is in charge of God's entire house, and we are God's house. And we'll see in the text this evening that house, or God's house, is synonymous with the temple, the place of worship. And so we're being told over and over in the New Testament that now um, where worship comes from is the individual, not the structure, and that we are indeed the temple of God. Now, like Solomon's temple, <clears throat> there are some similarities between the believer and the temple here that we'll read about this evening. Like Solomon's temple... We exist for, for one very specific purpose. You and I were created with the sole purpose of worshiping. We're worshipers, you all know that. You'll worship something. And if you don't worship God, there will be something else to worship and you will find your preferred object of worship and commit yourself to it or them or what have you. And so we are uh, created for the sole purpose of worship. In Luke chapter 4, verse 8, it says, and these are Jesus' words, He says, You must worship the Lord your God and serve only Him. You must worship the Lord your God. In Matthew 12, verse 30, He says that you must love the Lord your God with all your heart, all your soul, all your mind, all your strength. And so we see clearly that our worship is to be an all-encompassing endeavor. In fact, it's the sole reason why we were created, to worship the Lord, to worship God. And so tonight we're going to look at the building of Solomon's temple as it relates to our own role in this life as worshipers, the building of this amazing place of worship in Israel's history as it kind of compares and, you know, there's some, some parallels uh, to our own uh, personal growth as, as a disciple of Christ, um, as a, a temple for the Holy Spirit to dwell in. We're going to do a lot of reading. I'm going to try and uh, go as quick as I can through some of this. Um, starting in verse 1. 
First Kings chapter 6, verse 1, it says, And it came to pass in the 480th year after the children of Israel had come out of the land of Egypt, in the fourth year of Solomon's reign over Israel, in the month of Ziv, which is the second month, he began to build the house of the Lord. Okay? It tells us there that it happened 180 years after Israel had been freed from the slavery, the bondage of Egypt. Um, as we go through the Old Testament, I'm going to give you little bits and pieces of information that you'll want to hang on to as we continue to go through the Old Testament, regardless of which book we're in. Uh, but the uh, country of Egypt gets mentioned a lot throughout the Old Testament. You have to understand something that, um, according to biblical interpretation, Egypt um, most always stands as a representative of the world. Uh, and so when we speak of Egypt, we're speaking of the world, worldliness. And so um, this is, you know, some four, you know, nearly five centuries after their escape from the world, being saved out of the world. And so a lot of time has passed between their being delivered from slavery and the building of the temple. Their uh, escape from slavery and their, um, you know, the, their deliverance from Egyptian bondage is really a picture in the Old Testament of salvation. It is when God's people really became um, free to go and worship the Lord as they were chosen to do from long ago. And so when we see them um, passing through the Red Sea, that's kind of a picture of salvation. Um, Noah and the Ark scenario there is also a picture of uh, salvation. Passing through water from death to life, uh, escaping the Egyptian army and crossing the Red Sea into the safety of the other side is a passing through of, of the water sort of sim uh, symbolic of salvation. Uh, Noah and the ark, of course, the passing through water from death to life um, in a new world is, a, again, a picture of salvation. Uh, new Testament, we've got baptism, which is a picture of salvation, an old life being put fully underneath the water and then passing up to the um, surface again in new life. Uh, it doesn't save you, but it's symbolic of salvation, kind of keeping in line with some Old Testament uh, events. And so they're being slave, uh, saved from Egyptian slavery was a sort of prototype or a sort of uh, symbol of salvation for them. And now 480 years have passed, and they finally get around to the building of the temple, to the um, uh, creating a place of continual worship, which is interesting to me. I mean, if you start looking at the spiritual picture of things, a person gets saved, and it takes them forever to get around actually worshiping the Lord and devoting their life to Him. Now, why is there such a delay? I mean, if you look at the history of Israel, we can see why there was such a delay 480 years passed since their coming out of Egypt to actually getting around to building a temple. And I think that some of the reasons for the delay would sort of parallel the reasons why a person can sort of get saved in life and then take forever getting around to actually committing some, themselves to the worship and service of God. So see if some of these don't ring true. For the Israelites, it took them 480 years for these reasons. One, unbelief. It was because of unbelief that they wandered in the desert. Unbelief and wandering. They wandered for 40 years. That certainly postponed their getting around to building a central location for worship. And then they wandered and God said that they all died in the wilderness because of unbelief. How about complaining? I mean, any of you who have read through the Old Testament and their wanderings through the desert, you know that there was plenty of complaining and a lot of dying and death because of such complaints. There was a lot of compromise along the way. There was division even among the people of God. There was great inconsistency among them. There was poor leadership. There was constant war. All of these reasons cumulatively kind of add up to the reason why it was postponed for 480 years that they would actually get around to worshiping the Lord at the temple. And if you look at that, how many people would call themselves Christians and yet their lives are so void of worship and consistency and devotion for the very same reasons that Israel took 480 years? 
unbelief, wandering, complaining, compromise, division, poor leadership, constant war. Some people are delivered from their slavery of sin only to remain ungrounded in worship and devotion for a long, long time. Now, what were they doing in the meantime? Were they not worshiping? Did they have no place to come and, and, and offer their devotion to the Lord? No, they did. It was called the Ark of the Covenant. You guys remember that? The Ark of the Covenant was that like sort of portable box that God supposedly lived in, you know, that his presence was sort of there on that box, in that box, and wherever the ark was, God's presence was, and so it became kind of a good luck charm for Israel, and remember they would kind of like take it and bring it with them to war, and it never really stayed anywhere, it was just kind of always on the move, and sometimes an enemy nation would kidnap it. <laughs> it's a bad day when you get, you know, God's kidnapped. So, well, what did their worship look like before? Well, as long as their worship was kind of central to the ark, it was primitive, it was small, it was portable, it was temporary, it was unreliable. And now that they've got a temple built in Jerusalem, worship is going to look a lot different. In fact, in some cases, it may look in entirely opposite of what it used to be. Instead of being primitive, it's now very refined. Instead of being small and obscure, it's very impressive. Instead of being portable, it's stationary. Instead of being unreliable, now it's dependable. It can no longer be kidnapped or hijacked. And for how many of us, we're still living in that primitive sort of stage of worship? It's inconsistent. We do it when we can. We're devoted to the Lord kind of in our own mind. But if you ask anybody else who like goes to church where we do, no, there is no such consistency. I mean, we see them every once in a while, but I'm um, not too up. Who, is, who are they? Who are, you, who are we talking about? There, there's no real reliability. There's still a lot of wandering, still a lot of unbelief, still a lot of issues to deal with, constant warring, no peace. And I guess we could ask the opposite question as well. How many of us in here have matured to a point where our worship is consistent? We are completely devoted to the Lord. We ain't going anywhere. We are built on a solid foundation like a temple in Jerusalem, and we as the temple of God will continue forever, continuously offering worship and devotion to God. Whether we're here at the church or we're at our job or we're in school or we're with the family or we're wherever we are, we are a constant source of worship ongoing to the Lord. I think that God would have us mature in our worship. Some of us, we don't think about that too often. We think, well, we worship God. And some of us, <laughs> we're so sort of elementary in our understanding of worship that we, we think worship is nothing more than what we just did. A little guitar, a little singing, and then we're done worshiping. You have to understand that worship extends so far beyond the two songs that if you believe it's relegated to a couple of songs before a service only, your concept of worship needs to mature. Worship happens 24-7, or at least it's supposed to. Moving on in verse 2, because you remember we still have an, a whole, two whole chapters to go through. I mean, we're going to be here till like next Tuesday. Yes. Yeah. You won't be saying that by the time we're done. In verse 2 it says, Now the house which King Solomon built for the Lord, its length was 60 cubits, its width 20, and its height 30. Just so you guys know, this is going to get really exciting. All right. And cubits are about 18 inches in length, so a foot and a half per cubit if you're curious about how big the temple was. Because I know a lot of you are. <laughs> okay. The vestibule in front of the sanctuary of the house was 20 cubits along across the width of the house, and the width of the vestibule extended 10 cubits from the front of the house. And he made for the house windows with beveled, beveled frames. Against the wall of the temple, he built chambers all around. Against the walls of the temple, all around the sanctuary and the inner sanctuary. 
sanctuary, thus he made side chambers all around it. The lowest chamber was five cubits wide, the middle was six cubits wide, and the third was seven cubits wide, for he made narrow ledges around the outside of the temple so that the support beams would not be fastened into the walls of the temple. And the temple, when it was being built, was built with stone finished at the quarry so that no hammer or chisel or any iron tool was heard in the temple while it was being built. That, to me, is interesting. Um, I guess this is a unique way to construct. Um, they would take precise measurements at the temple site, and then they would go back to the quarry, however much distance that was. It was far enough away that you wouldn't hear any of the pounding or the hammering or the sawing of the stone. And they would then cut the stone to order, and then they would haul it up and place it. And now you're building a massive structure. Just huge stones and all kinds of... And it's quiet. This would be weird. Um, right? I mean, anybody who has ever worked construction, it's just a lot of noise. There's constant tools and pounding and swearing and dirty jokes. It's just constant noise. Right? Right? Yeah. So... <laughs> So, unless you work for a good guy construction or whatever his name is, what is it? Fancy, fancy, fancy something? Yeah, I don't know. <laughs> anyway, uh, you know, and so there is a lot of, is that bulb burnt out? Why is that light on? Huh, oh, the light's burnt out. Oh, geez. Anyway, um, it's Halloween already. Yeah. Sorry to distract you with the light. I'm just trying to keep you awake. That's all I'm doing tonight. My goal is to keep you awake. If I can keep you awake through all this, and that was a good study. At any rate, they're building this whole thing and it's silent there, it's quiet there. That to me is sort of interesting that all the work is taking place elsewhere and then they only assemble the materials once they got them there. And I think that if we're going to, you know, and I'm not in any way trying to look too deeply into the text, but there are some parallels here to this first temple in Jerusalem and the temple that is the disciple of Christ in modern times. There are some parallels here, and here's another one of them. The work that was being done was being done off-site, where you couldn't see the work. And then it was brought to the site for the assembling of the structure. And you remember that the Bible says that we are the Lord's temple, and in a very... Mm, interesting similarity here. For a disciple, much of the work that's being done in you, in your character, in your life, is being done in secret places. Undetectable. You could almost say off-site where nobody sees it. And yet the growth, once it comes together and the pieces are fit, it becomes visibly undeniable. Just like the temple of old. Much of what takes place, the refinement of a disciple, happens kind of off stage. But I'll tell you that when you enter the scene, people see it. That's a biblical concept. They will know you. Those are Jesus' words. They will know that you're my disciples. How? By how you live particularly by your love for one another, it will be visibly undeniable in those who live in unbelief that those who live in faith are his disciples because of how they look when they're around one another. And yet so much of what brings us to the place where we're actually able to love one another like that happens behind the scenes, doesn't it? Doesn't God just like do all of the pounding and all of the chiseling on you when you're kind of alone, you're kind of in your own head, he kind of like gets you by yourself and then he's just like, <laughs> and you're like, ah! And then you, you know, you come to church and you're like severely, like you're broken but healed in a funny way and then you got to get together and, and everybody looks at you and they're like, man, you seem like you're doing really good. You're doing pretty good. And yet, just the opposite is true. When, when God isn't doing his work and rather you've run from him and you're living in sin, you come to church and we all look at you, oh, you okay? You don't seem to be doing too well. And so when you're away from God and that work isn't taking place, you're at your worst. But when God is pounding the heck out of you, you're at your best. He's building you to become a place of worship, a dwelling place for the Holy Spirit, and, by the way, us collectively. In verse 8, 
says that the doorway for the middle story was on the right side of the temple, because you were wondering, weren't you? You're like, that door, was it, if we didn't put the door on the right or the left? It was the right. It was the right side. Yeah. They went up by the stairs to the middle story and from the middle to the third. So he built the temple and finished it. And he paneled the temple with beams and boards of cedar. And he built side chambers against the entire temple, each five cubits high. They were attached to the temple with cedar beams. Then the word of the Lord came to Solomon, saying, Concerning this temple which you are building, if you walk in my statutes, execute... Now listen, concerning this temple that you're building, right? Concerning the structure. But now what he's about to say really has nothing to do with the structure. So pay attention. Concerning this temple which you are building, if you walk in my statutes, execute my judgments, keep all my commandments, and walk in them, then I will perform my word with you, which I spoke to your father David, and I will dwell among the children of Israel and will not forsake my people Israel. He says nothing of the temple. He's speaking promises to the people who go to the temple, not the building. So, yes, concerning this temple, concerning the temple, I mean, this is almost prophetic. Concerning you, disciple, concerning you, who would call yourself a Christian, concerning you, if you walk in his commandments, if you keep his judgments, if you walk in them, then he will perform his word with you. He will keep his promises to you, which he's spoken to people in times past, and he will dwell with us collectively, and he will not forsake us or you. This isn't a promise to the building. I don't know that there's any verse in all of Scripture where God makes a promise to the brick structure at 30 North 58th Avenue West, Duluth, Minnesota. And yet the Bible throughout, from cover to cover, is filled with promises made to the faithful, made to those who would put their faith in Christ and walk in Him, those who would, by being filled with the power of God's Holy Spirit, He enables them to keep the commandments He commands them to keep, to observe the statutes He commands them to observe, to keep the laws, to follow the rules, to do His will. He makes that promise and says, I'll do that for you, you're the temple. Concerning that temple, if you do this, I'll do this. By the time you get to the New Testament, we don't talk much about temple anymore, do we? I mean, how many of you woke up Sunday morning and went, time to go to temple? You know? You tell your coworkers what you're doing this weekend. Well, I was helping temple. You know, all my people from temple, we got together and, you know, this Sunday I'm going to temple. Nobody talks about temple. We all talk about church. And the first time church gets mentioned in the New Testament is in Matthew chapter 16, and the original word, of course, in the Greek, because I know that you guys love Greek, so I'm always pleased to bring up Greek words. Church, in the Greek, ekklesia. Ekklesia. What does that mean? The word means people. Jesus says in Matthew chapter 16, I will build my church. And he's not talking about a brick building at this address. He's talking about you guys. He's talking about you in Matthew 16. I will build my ecclesia, my collective people. Over the course of all of human history, over the entire face of the earth, many tribes, nations, tongues, right, you know, they're all represented in the book of Revelation. Every people group who God has called out from the world and into a new life in Christ, those are the ecclesia. He's not talking about buildings. Jesus has never made promises to buildings. He's always made promises to people. He does it here in the Old Testament, and he does it in the New Testament. And so when God makes promises, they are made not to those who superficially cling to the church, the visible church, who attend a certain address on certain days, or those who are merely associated with a particular congregation or a particular denomination. He's making promises to the ecclesia, the people that he has called out, who by faith have been led out of the world and into a new life through faith in Christ. That's ecclesia. Those are the ones to whom the promises are made. Okay? Now that you know. 
Verse 14, So Solomon built the temple and finished it. And he built the inside walls of the temple with cedar boards. From the floor of the temple to the ceiling, he paneled the inside with wood, and he covered the floor of the temple with planks of cypress. All very fine lumber, by the way. And just pay attention to how much cedar is being used here. I mean, A, it will look beautiful, and B, I don't know how you feel about the smell, but boy, I think cedar has a nice, a nice scent, okay? Um, I mean, if you're a hamster lover, this would be a really great church, you know what I mean? Then he built the 20-cubit room at the rear of the temple, from floor to ceiling with cedar boards. There we go again. He built it inside as the inner sanctuary, as the most holy place. And in front of it, uh, the temple sanctuary was 40 cubits long. The inside of the temple was cedar, carved with ornamental buds and open flowers. All was cedar. There was no stone to be seen. So lots of stone was used in the structural component of the temple, and then it was all paneled with cedar. There was no stone, so the whole thing was covered with cedar. Cedar was the best lumber, just so you know. Okay? We're also going to find out that he uses lots of gold in this. All that to say that Solomon used his very best, his very best, to build this structure that would promote the worship of God among God's people. Only our best is appropriate, just so you know. If we're going to promote worship, if I individually and you yourself are going to do anything to promote greater worship among God's people collectively, then anything less than your best would be unwise. Solomon was a wise individual, he used his best. Anything less would be foolish. I mean, nobody is inspired to worship the Lord when we look at, you know, people giving their leftovers and, you know, trying to squeeze a little time in for God and that kind of thing. You know what really inspires a person to worship, at least what inspires me to worship, is when I see great sacrifice being made. I mean, truly, we should all be inspired to greater worship when we consider what Christ has done, right? Christ making the ultimate sacrifice. We look at that and we're like, that makes me want to worship God. That's how that works. In verse 19, it says, He prepared the inner sanctuary inside the temple to set the Ark of the Covenant of the Lord there. The inner sanctuary was 20 cubits long, 20 cubits wide, and 20 cubits high. He overlaid it with pure gold and overlaid the altar of cedar. So Solomon overlaid the inside of the temple with pure gold. I can't imagine what this looks like, by the way. If you're just, you know, I'm, I'm going to be reading a lot to you tonight, so just try and pay attention and get a visual if possible. All right? Lots of gold, real shiny, um, overlaid with pure gold. Um, incredible, I suppose to say the least. It says that he stretched gold chains across the front of the inner sanctuary and overlaid it with gold. The whole temple he overlaid with gold until he had finished all the temple. Also, he overlaid with gold the entire altar that was by the inner sanctuary. Inside the inner sanctuary, he made two cherubim of olive wood, each ten cubits high. Cherubim are like freaky angels. One wing of the cherub was five cubits, and the other wing of the cherub five cubits. Ten cubits from the tip of one wing to the tip of the other. And the other cherub was ten cubits. Both cherubim were of the same size and shape. The height of one cherub was ten cubits. So what's that, fifteen feet? I mean, we're talking a pretty good size angel statue there, two of them. And so was the other cherub. Then he set the cherubim inside the inner room, and they stretched out the wings of the cherubim so that the wing of the one touched one wall, and the wing of the other cherub touched the other wall. You remember that the whole thing was thirty... What was the width of the temple? It was like thirty cubits. I mean... You're talking that these angels nearly go across the entire room, so when you, you know, when you walk in, it's just gold. Everywhere is gold. And then there's these two immense angels, so it's awe-inspiring, right? And it's meant to be. It says that the uh, cherubs touched the other wall, and their wings touched each other in the middle of the room, so all the way across. Also, he overlaid the cherubim with gold. Then he carved all the walls of the temple all around in both the inner and outer sanctuaries with carved figures of cherubim, palm trees, and open flowers. Um, if you care to, uh, you could find some commentary without much effort and read about the significance of all of these things. Um, I may, if you know, Scripture allows, 
um, revisit some of this stuff and tell you the significance of all of these things. Um, but there is significance in everything that we're reading here. Um, just keep in mind um, 1 Timothy 3.16. Uh, all of Scripture is God-breathed and profitable. So even this stuff, and I'm, I'm not trying to be funny, I'm just saying that some, sometimes in Scripture it gets dry and like, oh, you, you know, you read it and you're like, all oh, this cherubims and stuff, like, so what? It's profitable, just so you know. There's, there's really neat things in here. I'm not going to unpack all of it. I'm trying to go through as quickly as we can here. It says that the floor of the temple he overlaid with gold in verse 30, both the inner and outer sanctuaries. For the entrance of the inner sanctuary, he made doors of olive wood. Uh, the lintel and doorposts were one-fifth of the wall. The two doors were of olive wood, and he carved on them figures of cherubim, palm trees, open flowers, and overlaid them with gold, and he spread gold on the cherubim and on the palm trees. So for the door of the sanctuary, he also made doorposts of olive wood, one-fourth of the wall. And the two doors were of cypress wood. Two panels comprised one folding door, and two panels comprised the other folding door. And he carved cherubim, palm trees, and open flowers on them, and overlaid them with gold applied evenly on the carved work. And he built the inner court with three rows of hewn stone and a row of cedar beams. In the fourth year, of the, in the, fourth year the foundation of the house of the Lord was laid in the month of Ziv. We remember that from the beginning of the chapter. And in the eleventh year, in the month of Bull, which is the eighth month, the house was finished in all its details and according to all its plans. So, he was seven years in building it. it. took seven years to build this. And it says here that it was built according to, um, in all its details and according to all its plans. All right. We just read lots of boring details, didn't we? Didn't we? All of these specifics and Measurements, the materials that were used are given, the process by which it took place, the procedures, even dates and times are given. We get ornamental details, right? Cherubim, palm trees, flowers. Structural details, we know how it was built with stone. It was overlaid with cedar panels. All kinds of details, visual details, spatial details, sizes, all that. Just details, but listen, they are details. And that's significant because each of them was carefully observed and perfectly fulfilled according to a plan that someone else had drawn up. Do you remember that Solomon didn't, he was no architect. His father had the blueprints for all of this. And David got them from God and then gave them to Solomon. So all of this work is being carried out by Solomon to fulfill a plan that wasn't his, an idea that was not his own. And that to me would be a thing of relief and a thing of frustration if I was Solomon. But I was commissioned to carry out a plan that someone else drew up. It would be a relief because, well, I didn't have to go through the work of drawing it up. And it would be frustrating because I don't get to use any of my creative license whatsoever. I have to do it according to every little detail on the plan. And I think for some of us that would be a very frustrating thing because we're kind of creative people. Maybe we're not artistic, but we're creative in the sense that we all want a little bit of licensure to kind of sculpt for ourselves the life that we want to live. And then God comes along and says, I've got a predetermined plan. You don't get any creative license. You live according to my will, to the T. Every cross of the T and every dot of the I is mine to call. My decision to make, my dream to fulfill, you obey me. We get no creative license. And kudos to Solomon for sticking with the plan. Did you know that you and I are all called as disciples of Christ to live lives not of our own making? We get no say. We're to invest our time and our money and our mental faculties and everything that we've got to the completion of a project that someone else started. That sounds, 
That sounds rather unappealing to like you know guys like me who want a little bit of flexibility and, and make things you know the way I want them. But I'm telling you, the closer you walk with Christ, the more you find out that you don't have a choice. You don't get to make the call. God's nosy. The more you, the the more room you give Him to design your life, the more He'll take. Because He wants your life to look exactly like the blueprint that he drew up before he ever set out to create the earth. He has a specific design for your life. 1 Corinthians 6.19 says, Your life is not your own. You were bought. Jesus paid a hefty price to turn your life into what he always created it to be. He's not going to give up too easily. We can play tug of war with him and go, but I want it to look like this. And he's going to go, I want it to look like this. And we're going to go, I want it to look like this. You can play that game, but you just have to understand that he paid a hefty price and he's, gonna lo he's not going to he's not going to lose that, that, that battle too easily. Moving on to chapter 7, we'll see if we can't get through this. In verse 38 of the last chapter, it says that the house was finished in all its details and according to all its plans. He was seven years in building it. Moving right on into the next chapter, it says, But Solomon took thirteen years to build his own house, so he finished all his house. It took seven years to build the temple and thirteen to build his own. Now, if, if you're like me, you might automatically jump to the conclusion that he's giving more to himself than to God building himself a better house, you know, taking almost twice as long to build. I don't know if that thought crossed your mind. Um, we don't know that that's the case. I don't know that it says in Scripture that he was just being self-centered and wanted a better place to live than he wanted his people to worship. But um, I think it might have been due to the fact that he had no blueprint for his house. He didn't have any materials collected for his house. The materials were collected for the temple, and the plans were drawn up for the temple, but now he's on his own. Maybe it took a little extra long because he didn't know. Again, he's no architect. But you'll notice as we read through this um, that the, the structures he builds after the temple is finished um, resemble the temple in various ways. Solomon took 13 years to build his own house, so he finished all his house. He also built the house of the forest of Lebanon. Its length was 100 cubits, its width 50 cubits, and its height 30 cubits, with four rows of cedar pillars and cedar beams on the pillars. And it was paneled with cedar above the beams that were on 45 pillars, 15 to a row. There were windows with beveled frames in three rows, and window was opposite window in three tiers. Already it's looking similar to the blueprints that his dad gave him for the temple. You've got cedar paneling, you've got um, cedar beams, you've got beveled windows. In verse 5 it says, And all the doorways and doorposts had rectangular frames, and window was opposite window in three tiers. He also made the hall of pillars. Its length was 50 cubits, and its width 30 cubits, and in front of them was a portico with pillars, and a canopy was in front of them. Then he made a hall for the throne, the hall of judgment, where he might judge. And it was paneled with cedar from floor to ceiling. And the house where he dwelt had another court inside the hall of like workmanship, similar in other words. Solomon also made a house like this hall for Pharaoh's daughter, whom he had taken as wife. So in other words, her house looked similar also. All of these were of costly stones, cut to size, trimmed with saws, inside and out, from the foundation to the eaves, and also on the outside of the great court. The foundation was of costly stones, large stones, some ten cubits and some eight cubits. Again, this is very similar to the construction of the temple. And above were costly stones, hewn to size, and cedar wood. The great court was enclosed with three rows of hewn stones and a row of cedar beams. So were the inner court of the house of the Lord and the vestibule of the temple. So were the inner court of the house of the Lord and the vestibule of the temple. It looked a lot like the temple. Which is interesting to me. Again, I think there are some similarities here. We see that a lot of the same materials are being used, hewn stone, cedar, and all of that, with a very similar construction style and construction method, which to me says that Solomon built his personal life 
according to the initial framework that God had set for him. He set to work first and foremost to build up a place of worship and devotion and then built everything else in sort of an, uh, the, uh, as an echo of that. And we as disciples should be doing something very similar. Where central to our very lives is the worship of God and our devotion to Him and everything else is built around that. And it's all going to take on the flavor that comes from our initial framework of worship. Everything, is going, everything in your life is going to be flavored with the worship of God. So that, like I mentioned earlier, worship for you, in the truest sense, broadens from the idea of singing before church to how you work when you go to your job and how you raise your children or how you love your spouse. All of it becomes flavored with the worship that is central to your life. Everything you do and everything you are is flavored with worship. Okay. Verse 13. Okay. You guys ready? Oh, now King Solomon sent and brought Huram from Tyra. He was the son of a widow from the tribe of Naphtali, and his father was a man of Tyra, a bronze worker. He was filled with wisdom and understanding and skill in working with all kinds of bronze work. So he came to King Solomon and did all of his work. It's interesting. I mean, Solomon is getting the best craftsmen that, like, the world has to offer. I mean, he's importing materials. He's hiring out of country. This is going to be awesome. And he cast two pillars of bronze, each one 18 cubits high, and a line of 12 cubits measured the circumference of each. And then he made two capitals of cast bronze to set on the tops of the pillars. The heights of one capital was five cubits, and the height of the other capital was five cubits. He made a lattice network with wreaths of chain work for the capitals which were on top of the pillars. Seven chains for one capital, and then seven for the other capital. So he made the pillars and two rows of pomegranates above the network all around to cover the capitals that were on top, and thus he did for the other capital. The capitals were on top of the pillars, and the hall uh, were in the shape of lilies, four cubits. The capitals of the two pillars also had pomegranates above by the convex service, which was next to the network. And there were 200 such pomegranates and rows on each of the capitals all around. Then he set up the pillars by the vestibule of the temple. He set up the pillar on the right and called its name Jachin. And he set up the pillar on the left and called its name Boaz. The tops of the pillars were in the shape of lilies. So the work of the pillars was finished. <coughs> uh, I'm going to continue reading through to the end of the chapter. Um, I make no apologies for boring you. If you can get anything out of this, it's that... Um, Sometimes details are boring, but very important. And I think that if we're not careful, we can live a life that is so kind of fed up with details that we tend to overlook them and wait for God to give us like real, real big, you know, picture commands. But the little stuff, we overlook. Okay? Let's not get bored with our everyday life, but let's let God design who we will become, and what we're to do, even in the details, all right? So make no apologies for boring you. <laughs> and he made the sea from cast bronze, ten cubits from one brim to the other. It was completely round. Its height was five cubits, and a line of thirty cubits measured its circumference. Again, uh, five cubits high, so you're talking seven and a half feet tall. So this is above your head. 10 cubits across, which is 15 feet. So this is a huge bathtub. I think that it would hold, if I'm not mistaken, 11,500 gallons of water. So there's a lot of water in it. And if you kind of pay attention to how it's built, it looks cool, all right? It says, below its brim were ornamental buds encircling it all around, 10 to a cubit, all the way around the sea. It's interesting that they don't call it a bath, they call it a sea. The ornamental buds were cast in two rows when it was cast. It stood on 12 oxen, all right? That's the cool part to me. Um, I think they're bronze. 12 great big horned bulls and this huge 
see is on top of their backs. It says three were looking toward the north, three looking toward the west, three looking toward the south, three toward the east. The sea was set upon them, and all their back parts pointed inward, so they're all facing outward. It was a handbreadth thick, and its brim was shaped like the brim of a cup, like a lily blossom. Very ornamental, very beautiful. It contained 2,000 baths. Um, this would have been a striking feature to behold. Really cool sculpture, if anything. I mean, you think of that bull on Wall Street? I do. You know that, that sculpture? Do you guys know what I'm talking about? Google bull on Wall Street. Does anybody know what I'm talking about? Okay. He also made ten carts of bronze. Four cubits was the length of each, each cart. Four cubits its width. Uh, three cubits its height. And this was the design of the carts. They had panels, and the panels were between frames. On the panels that were between the frames were lions, oxen, cherubim, angels. And on the frames was a pedestal on top. Below the lions and oxen were wreaths of plated work. Every cart had four bronze wheels and axles of bronze, and its four feet had supports. Under the laver were supports of cast bronze beside each wreath. Its opening inside the crown at the top was one cubit in diameter, and the opening was round, shaped like a pedestal. One and a half cubits in outside diameter, and also on the opening were engravings, but the panels were square, not round. Under the panels were the four wheels, and the axles of the wheels were jointed to the cart. The height of a wheel was one and a half cubits. The workmanship of the wheels was like the workmanship of a chariot wheel. Their axle pins, their rims, their spokes, their hubs were all of cast bronze. And there were four supports at the four corners of each cart. Its supports were part of the cart itself. On top of the cart, at the height of the half of a cubit, it was perfectly round. And on top of the cart, its flanges and its panels were of the same casting. On the plates of its flanges and on its panels, he engraved cherubim, lions, and palm trees wherever there was a clear space on each with wreaths all around. Thus he made the ten carts. All of them were of the same mold, one measure and one shape. And he made ten lavers of bronze. Each laver contained forty baths, and each laver was four cubits. On each of the ten carts was a laver. And he put five carts on the right side of the house and five on the left of the house. He set the sea on the right side of the house toward the southeast. Again, very detailed, very striking in its visual appearance, <clears throat> and very expensive, by the way. Um, lots and lots of bronze, lots of material just to make this, lots of expense in, the, in hiring the workers to build all of it, lots and lots of money. Um, pay attention because I think we're going to be told here that they didn't even keep track of how much bronze was used because it was immeasurable. Hiram, that's that guy, made the lavers and the shovels and the bowls. So Hiram finished doing all the work that he was to do for King Solomon for the house of the Lord. The two pillars, the two bowl-shaped capitals that were on top of the two pillars, the two networks covering the two bowl-shaped capitals which were on top of the pillars. 400 pomegranates for the two networks, two rows of pomegranates for each network to cover the two bowl-shaped capitals that were on top of the pillars. The ten carts, the ten lavers on the carts, one sea, twelve oxen under the sea, the pots, the shovels, the bowls, all these articles which Hiram made for King Solomon for the house of the Lord were of burnished bronze. In the plain of Jordan, the king had them cast in clay molds between Succoth and Zaratan. And Solomon didn't weigh all the articles because there were so many. The weight of the bronze was not determined. Thus, Solomon had all the furnishings made for the house of the Lord, the altar of gold and the table of gold on which was the showbread, the lampstands of pure gold, five on the right side and five on the left in front of the inner sanctuary with the flowers and the lamps and the wick trimmers of gold, the basins, the trimmers, the bowls, the ladles, the censers of pure gold, and the hinges of gold, both for the doors of the inner room, the most holy place, and for the doors of the main hall of the temple. So, all the work that King Solomon had done for the house of the Lord was finished, and Solomon brought in the things which his father David had dedicated. Now, let me read that again, in case you fell asleep. It says that it was all finished, and Solomon brought in the things which his father David had dedicated. The silver and the gold and the furnishings, he put them in the treasuries of the house of the Lord. Okay? More boring details, huh? Not only did Solomon build all of this according to a plan of someone else's design, but that last verse there indicates that all of this work was also done at someone else's expense. As if I hadn't read to you enough already, I'm going to read you another passage. You don't need to turn there. It's 1 Chronicles chapter 29. I'm going to read you nine verses. This is in the New Living Translation, if you're curious. 
This goes back to the time when King David was still around and it says that he, King David, turned to the entire assembly and said, My son Solomon, whom God has clearly chosen as the next king of Israel, is still young and inexperienced. The work ahead of him is enormous, tremendous. For the temple he will build is not for mere mortals, it's for the Lord God himself. And here's what David says. Using every resource at my command, I have gathered as much as I could for the building of the temple of my God. Now there is enough gold, silver, bronze, iron, and wood, as well as great quantities of onyx, other precious stones, costly jewels, and all kinds of fine stones and marble. And now, because of my devotion to the temple of my God, I'm giving all of my own private treasures of gold and silver to help in the construction. Did you get that? David says, I'm giving from my own private stash gold and silver to help in the construction. This is in addition to the building materials I've already collected for his holy temple. I'm donating more than 112 tons of gold <laughs> from Ophir. Must have been good gold. 112 tons of gold. Me and Sarah just took a couple pairs of gold earrings up to the mall to cash them in. And they, I could hardly tell I was carrying anything. It was earrings. And that they put them on the scale and it weighs a fraction of an ounce or something. They give you like a hundred bucks. It's like, <laughs> we got any more earrings? I'm like, is this real? You know, like, put that on there. 112 tons of it and 262 tons of refined silver to be used for overlaying the walls of the buildings and for the other gold and silver work to be done by the craftsmen. Now, stopping there, all of this work that Solomon did was done at someone else's expense, namely the expense of his father. Is that significant to anybody? We are the temple of God. New Testament vernacular. We are the structures from whom worship to the Lord should emanate. True worship is allowing God to have every detail of His foreordained plan for you to be fulfilled by you. That's true worship. And all of this has been made available to you, not out of your own funds, but at His expense. God is the one who sent His Son to make it possible for you to be restored as a worshiper of the true and living God. And it was very costly, wasn't it? Because it cost Him the life of His Son. He paid in blood. And the Bible says that it's far more precious than gold. I mean, ask God, would you rather have given 112 tons of gold or the blood of your son if each one was viable? Oh, the gold for sure. But our lives couldn't be bought back with gold, and so he gave his son. So all of this was made possible at our father's expense. Just like Solomon, all of this was done at his father's expense. Now, I want to read to you a little bit more out of 1 Chronicles 29. I haven't read all my nine verses yet. <laughs> okay, so here's David. He's saying to the assembly, I've sacrificed much. I've given out of my own resources 112 tons of gold, 262 tons of refined silver. He says to the assembly, he says this, Now then, who will follow my example and give offerings to the Lord today? Then the family leaders, the leaders of the tribes of Israel, the generals and captains of the army, and the king's administrative officers all gave willingly, all of them. For the construction of the temple of God, they gave about 188 tons of gold, 10,000 gold coins, 375 tons of silver, 675 tons of bronze, and 3,750 tons of iron. They also contributed numerous precious stones, which were deposited in the treasury of the house of the Lord under the care of Jael, a descendant of Gershon. The people rejoiced over the offerings, for they had given freely and wholeheartedly to the Lord, and King David was filled with joy. So this expensive project called the building of Solomon's temple was done according to plan, someone else's plan, 
and at a great cost, someone else's expense, namely his own father and many others. God paid the ultimate price to make us worshipers, but do you know who around you has also made great sacrifice to turn you into a worshiper? We have. We contribute through our own sacrificial offering to making you a better Christian, to making you a disciple. And would anyone in here disagree if I said it would be a lot safer and a lot easier and we could all save a lot of time and money if we didn't invest in one another? Well, I mean, we could all be self-protective and just sort of take that approach to church, or we can do what we're called to do through Scripture, which is to invest our lives in making one another greater worshipers of the Lord. This is exactly what Solomon is doing. came at someone else's expense. It always does. Guys, we were created as worshipers. Sin keeps us from worshiping God as we ought. That's what stops us. That's what turns us from God worshipers into idol worshipers. And by the way, Satan wants to destroy you. And the way he destroys you is by trying to keep you a worshiper of something other than God. Anything other than God. And so God then takes it upon himself to build us from the ground up <clears throat> into proper worshipers who are grounded in and consistent with our devotion to him. And the Bible says that God will finish the work that he's begun. It's a tremendous project. It's a huge undertaking. But God is doing it in us, collectively, and in you, individually, from the ground up. So here's a few questions to leave you with. I know this has gone long, but I was mostly reading to you, that's all. I haven't been doing a lot of preaching. Just let me get my preaching in. <laughs> a few questions to leave you with. One, is, it, is, is you becoming... <coughs> A, a stable worshiper taking longer than necessary? Like that whole 480-year bit. So does it need to take that long? Are we postponing our own rate of growth as a disciple of Christ because of perhaps complaining or compromise or inconsistency? Are you stable? Are you grounded in your worship and your devotion to the Lord? Here's another question. Are you aware of the promises that God has made to you as an elect member of his community? Are you aware of the promises that he's made to you and the conditions of those promises? Are you aware of those? That God wants to fulfill all of this and more if we will obey his commands, if we will observe his statutes, etc., etc. Let me ask you this. In these two chapters, we saw David investing his best and ultimately, his son then taking the best that his father offered and making good on that offering and continuing to see to it that the best was given. Are you investing the best of what you have into your worship of God? Are we living for Christ? I guess that's the long and the short of it. Are we living his plan? Is our life, the life we're living, somebody else's idea? Or are we live in our own dream, fulfilling our own plans? Because, guys, if that's happening, you're missing out. You're missing out. I think by the time this temple was built, it was such a magnificent thing. Of course, next uh, time we come together for chapter 8, we're going to see how awesome it was. I mean, there's, it's going to be a party. But some of us were missing out on the party. Because we are the temple of the Holy Spirit and, and because we're inconsistent, because we're compromising, because we're wandering, we're, we're missing out on the glory, the wonder, the amazement of a life of devotion as a disciple of Christ. Um, I can't see into your heart. I don't, I never claim to know what's going on in you. You know, the work that God does in a person takes place apart from my observation. So, my hope and prayer for you is that you're allowing God to do His great work in you in bringing you into that place of worshiper. That you are the temple of the Lord and that He is being glorified in there. And we collectively as a church that we're doing our job 
and that this is really a party. It's our honor. It's our joy. This is what we're here for. It's why we were created. That's our hope. It is Jesus' fellowship that we worship God. It's what we were built to do. Let's pray. Father, we thank you for um, the scriptures that you've left us with, and certainly there are lots of details, lots of things to read and, and think about. Um, but the application here is um, very clear. We are to be worshipers. You have given us the honor of becoming the receptacle within whom the Holy Spirit dwells. And we are astonished like the Apostle Paul was astonished when he said, Who are we? We're clay, we're clay vessels. We have this treasure in earthen vessels, which is really amazing that we of all things would become the dwelling place of God Almighty, that the Creator would live within His creation. God, we pray that You would make us worshipers, that our devotion to You would only increase as we surrender ourselves to Your perfect and very detailed plan for our lives. We know this came at the expense of others, particularly your son. Thank you for giving him up for our sakes. I can't imagine that that was easy for you as a father any more than it was easy for him as a son to have gone through what took place 2,000 years ago. And we pray, Father, that we take these things to heart and remember them forever. We praise your name.